So thank you all for being here this morning. I'm delighted to see all of you here. Thank you for, thank you for, for being here for this important event in the University of Vermont's history, the inaugural Patrick Leahy Public Policy Forum, the U.S. War in Vietnam, looking back after 50 years. Uh, we had a wonderful evening last night with our keynote speaker, David Marinus. Um, thank you, David, for your, your amazing remarks. You'll be able to hear from, from David again this afternoon. We have three exceptional panels uh, that should be, be provocative, uh, informative, and inspiring. Um, and my job is to serve as master of ceremonies and host. And in that role, I am supposed to limit my remarks to a very short two minutes. However, I have been tasked with welcoming Senator Patrick Leahy to the stage. And I don't know how I would summarize even his last year in office and the impact it's had on Vermont and the university in two minutes, let alone the 48 years he served as our senator. So I will begin at the end very briefly to say that, that among the things he was able to accomplish for the university in his final year in office was a $12 million grant for the Institute of Rural Partnerships at the University of Vermont and a $30 million endowment to support student success and the Honors College, for which we are incredibly grateful, Senator. Thank you. <laughs> Jumping back nearly 50 years, however, one of the Senator's first and most significant votes was the one he cast to end the war in Vietnam. And so, for the inaugural Leahy Public Policy Forum, we felt it appropriate to begin our, our journey uh, thinking about the Senator's legacy with thinking about that vote and its lingering impact. So today, we will hear not only about the war in Vietnam, but also how it impacted Vermonters, people in universities, and the world. I am delighted to welcome our friend, Patrick Sen Senator Patrick Leahy to the podium to introduce today's events. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, David. It, uh, you know, it is, it is great to be here and the memories that have, have come up as we've as we've gone through this, have been amazing. And I would, uh, I, I was saying to someone that, or several of you, that um, there are many of us here of an age and or have been involved with the war in Vietnam, but they also have students for whom it, you learn about it the same way People my age may learn about Pearl Harbor. And so what they've done in having all these people come and speak has been so helpful. I want to thank David Mar uh, Marinus. David spoke yesterday noon to a group of, just a small group of students, and they were locked on his every word, and then he spoke last night. And I thought, what a wonderful history lesson. The uh, uh, Patty Prelock and David, you were there and helped introduce him, and he just he made a terrible part of our history very much alive, not judgmentally, but very much alive. And so this symposium is the first one I hope to be an annual Leahy Honors College event. And we're here on the 50th anniversary of the end of the U.S. war in Vietnam. A lot of us remember that as though it was yesterday. But that war deeply affected Vermonters in every state. And we're going to hear from some who have spent years, as I have, working to overcome some of the worst legacies of that war. Those humanitarian and reconciliation programs which have received bipartisan support, few things do these days, are ongoing. For the past 50 years, we've debated the lessons of Vietnam. 
I hope with this symposium, beginning with David's remarks, we have a deeper understanding of, of those. And Ambassador Zone, who's here with his wife, sister and brother-in-law and his staff, thank you for joining us. He and I have talked many, many times, and met many times, and it means a lot. And just before I pass that, the microphone to him, would my team of archivists please stand up? They're right here. Don't be shy. Uh, <clears throat> if you go over, if you go over to the building, uh, I think of the address. I know the name on the building. It's, it's embarrassing, the Patrick Leahy building. But go there, in the library, in it are so many things I brought back over the years from Vietnam, and we had to store them in my office in Washington. These three went and dug them out of boxes and boxes and got them on, on display. So you're all welcome to come over and, and see them, and Lydia will make sure you can. So with that, I'm going to pass the microphone to Ambassador Zung for any opening remarks. And my friend, I want to just thank you again for being here. Very, very much. Yeah, good morning, very good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Patrick Leahy and uh, Madame Marcel. Uh, I uh, often prefer calling them uh, Uncle Patrick and uh, Auntie Marcel. <laughs> yes. Uh, President uh, Patricia Pilok, Pilok uh, distinguished uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, it is a true honor and pleasure to stand here today uh, at this uh, remarkable event, not only to uh, commemorate the milestones of the U.S.-Vietnam relations, but also look forward to the futures, uh, guided by the same spirit of courage compassion and cooperation that has brought us this far. It is particularly significant to do so at the Patrick Leahy Honors College, named for a man whose tireless dedication to healing the wounds of the war and fostering cooperation between our two nations will forever be remembered. The visions of this honor college, empowering students through learning, instilling courage, and fostering compassion, resonate deeply with the life and legacies of Senator Leahy. With that, Senator Leahy, we are forever thankful for your enduring leadership and uh, unwavering commitment. So ladies and gentlemen, it is hard to fathom the extraordinary progress made in nearly 30 years from anniversaries, our relationships, which began anew with a normalization of diplomatic uh, ties in 1995, has never ceased to blossom. We became uh, comprehensive strategic uh, partners of the CSP just uh, last year. Our cooperation now spans across all critical fields from uh, politics and diplomacy to trade and investment, defense, war legacy, reconciliations, uh, education, and people-to-people -people exchanges. The timing of this forum could not be more uh, fitting as we pause to uh, reflect on the road taken. A special thanks to President uh, Patricia Prelock and all the coordinators and staff of the Senator Leahy's office and uh, uh, the University of Vermont for bringing us together to reflect, remember, and uh, look forward. Uh, thank you so much for the warm hospitalities and ex excellent arrangements extended to me and uh, my team from DC. And I would like I would also like to uh, express my sincere thanks to Team Breezers. Uh, team's uh, meticulous uh, coordination, not only in organizing this important forum, 
but also in uh, facilitating my uh, productive visit to Vermont is uh, greatly appreciated. Vermont stands out with its natural beauty, innovative mindset, and strong focus on sustainab sustainability. As a center for renewable energies, agriculture, education, and innovation, where the University of Vermont is leading the charge, you know, Vermont offers fertile ground for cooperation with Vietnam. Uh, by fostering these connections, we can create meaningful opportunities for growth and collaboration, benefiting both our economies and societies. So ladies and gentlemen, just as uh, Senator Leahy had built bridges uh, of reconciliations and progress, so too much, uh, so too must we uh, in ensure that the next generation carries forward the, his legacy. The transformation of the U.S.-Vietnam relationship stands as a beacon of hope in today's uncertain world. Our remarkable journey offers a powerful model for other nations, showing that even the deepest wounds can heal and that the path forward, uh, path toward peace and shared prosperity is always possible, no matter how challenging the history. So may the conversations, the reflections, and exchanges throughout the morning uh, deepen our understanding and foster the spirit of cooperation that has defined the extraordinary journey between Vietnam and the United States. Let this forum not only serve as a commemoration of history, but as a stepping stone toward an even brighter future. I wish for the tremendous success of the forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Senator. I am happy to introduce the moderator for the first panel. Uh, Jane Lindholm was, for a number of years, a familiar voice on Vermont Public as the host of Vermont Edition. She is a producer and host now of, uh, but why? But why? Um, I, I, I listen to it all the time and I couldn't, had a blank. Uh, but why? Uh, a, a podcast for kids. Uh, I do listen to it regularly, but I'm always delighted when she shows up on, on the fun drive because then I get to hear her in the morning again. Um, but she will be hosting the first panel and be introducing our speakers for us. Thank you, David, and it's an honor to be here participating and learning from all of the speakers last night and tonight. Um, and if you were expecting Erica Heilman, I'm sorry to say she had a family emergency, so I am filling in for her as moderator today. Um, and I would love to introduce our three guests here who have been sitting very patiently and waiting, and um, they are gonna do most of the talking during this panel. Um, Rusty Sachs is with us today. Rusty grew up in Norwich, still lives in Norwich, enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1964 after flunking out of Harvard. <laughs> after two years of training, they made Rusty an officer and a helicopter pilot. He arrived in Vietnam in July of 1966 as a replacement pilot, flew 725 combat missions before returning to serve another few years as a helicopter instructor where he says he had the luxury of knowing specifically who was trying to kill me. He returned to Harvard, he practiced law for more than 20 years while also teaching as an adjunct instructor of combat leadership for the Marine Corps. He has two children and four grandchildren and they're all Vermonters. John Tracy, also with us today. John describes himself as a former stay-at-home dad a former state legislator and a retired U.S. Senate staffer. He worked for Senator Leahy as a field representative and state director for many years. John served in Vietnam from December of 1971 until November of 1972. 
He was with the 1st Signal Brigade for a few months as a telecommunications specialist and then head clerk for the communications center. He obtained the rank of sergeant and transferred to the 229th Assault Helicopter Battalion 1st Cavalry Division as a door gunner and then crew chief. When the 1st Cavalry stood down, John was transferred to the 358th Aviation Detachment, 525th Military Intelligence Group, serving as a helicopter crewman. And also with us today is Bill Donahue. Bill is also a retired lawyer, practiced law in Vermont for over 41 years. He and his wife have been married for 55 years, and they have lived in the same house in Heartland for 40 years. They have three sons. To avoid being drafted into the Army, Bill enlisted in the Marine Corps. His military occupational specialty was infantry officer. He was sent to Da Nang, Vietnam as a second lieutenant on October 9, 1967. He was assigned to the 1st Marine Division, 1st Regiment, 2nd Battalion, Gulf Company. There he served as a rifle platoon commander and later as a weapons platoon commander. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you for being with us today. How often, other than when you've been asked specifically to sit in front of people and talk about it, do you think about Vietnam, the war, the place, and your time and role in it? Rusty? Um, how often? Far less frequently than 50 years ago, I can assure you that. However, there are <coughs> moments uh, of those 13 plus months um, in the combat zone that, that come back um, frequently during sleep, still wake up occasionally from nightmares, and uh, Erica had asked us to, to, to try to isolate moments that, that were points of demarcation where there was life before and life after. And, and there were two of those for me. And you're going to ask short questions of each of us, or do you <laughs> no, want right, to have going, us run going, on? Keep going. OK, OK. Um, the first one was uh, a couple of weeks after I arrived in the country. I was, I was the junior most second lieutenant in the squadron, flying as co-pilot and, uh, and trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And uh, one day, perhaps my second week in country, but maybe not that, um, maybe not that <coughs> late after I arrived, where a bunch of us had flown out to a, a field position where there were artillery and there was a, a small mid uh, evacuation receiving triage station. Um, and, uh, and we shut down and we were waiting there for people to tell us what to do. And in the meantime, uh, another helicopter, another section of two helicopters arrived from a different direction who had been transporting VCS, Viet Cong suspects, prisoners of war. Um, Everybody was a Viet Cong suspect at that point. They shut down near us, and uh, when they went to unload the, uh, the bound and blindfolded uh, prisoners, um, the crewmen unloaded them. But they unloaded them by grabbing ankles and hands and throwing them out the door of the helicopter so they were piling up on the ground. And uh, I was a little taken aback. And I, I, I felt I'm supposed to say, no, you're not supposed to do that. Hey, that's, that's inhumane, you don't do that. I also <laughs> was one week in country, and, and I didn't want to get labeled as the guy who they put on the fragging list. And nobody else was doing anything. There were, there were, there were several senior officers up all the way as high as captain uh, who weren't doing anything, so I just kept my mouth shut and fa found when I got home and when I was analyzing myself all that time that I was, was morally deficient. And I talked about it with guys in the tent. We, we lived in these eight or 10 bunk tents in, in the field, but they were neatly lined up. Um, and, uh, and everybody says, don't, don't, don't drive yourself crazy. Don't think about that. Well, I lived with that. 
And in January, that would have been in August of 1966. In January or February of 67, I had managed to get my hands on an, uh, an M1 carbine, which is a nice short rifle and it fits in the helicopter really nicely. And I figured that'd be good. I had it for a day or so and I'd never fired it, but didn't, didn't, uh, didn't have an awful lot of ammo for it. It was a nice cartridge. Remember the carbine? Cartridge? 30, 30 caliber. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and I said, I, I, next time I get a chance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sight it in and make sure the sights are, will at least be able to help me hit, hit a barn. Um, and, uh, and one day we were shut down, shut down in another position like that. And it was kind of flat terrain, but I needed to sight the thing in. So I went off to the edge of the position and looked around for something something to shoot at, and there's a guy plowing his field. And I worked the action, took a sight on him, and he moved his head, and I thought, oh shit, that looks like Artie. If for just an instant, I thought it was my cousin Artie. <laughs> and I said, what the hell's happening to me? And it, it's still it's still happening. I'm 80. <laughs> I was 22, maybe 24, something like that. Oh, we did the arithmetic. I was 24, wasn't I? Um, and th th those are the two spikes. I've got lots more stories, but I'm not going to inflict them on you yet because I've got two other Marines who have the same sort of Army. set of experience. Uh, yeah. Army. Oh. Army. Yeah, I'm Marine oh, and a soldier. So sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. Yeah, it, those are clearly powerful moments that have stuck with you as you think through your life. Mm -hmm. And we talked last night with David Marinus and, uh, and the audience about this feeling of moral guilt that so many veterans have. Did that, those stories resonate with you, Bill? Yeah, I could, uh, I could tell one where I feel complicit in um, some waterboarding and also the death of a civilian. <coughs> uh, I was a rifle platoon commander with Gulf Company 2-1. Our commanding officer was Captain Copeland. He was very gungy, by which I mean very bellicose. He wanted to kill Kong. And we were uh, south of our battalion CP. It was a hot, bright, clear day. We were by a river. I can't remember the name of the river. And Captain Copeland and his CP group and a few other Marines, among them me, uh, had gathered and he wanted me to witness a questioning. Um, there was a program called the Chu Hoi program, which I think means open arms. And under this open arms program, the Americans invited uh, North, Vietnamese, North Vietnamese soldiers to join them uh, to betray their country. And they were paid. And if they didn't agree, I don't know what happened to them, but nothing good. Anyway, there were two uh, Chu Hoi's um, one of whom was said to be a first sergeant, and then there was his uh, sidekick. Uh, and they were going to interrogate two civilians. Um, they strapped them down on a board, tied them down to a board, tilted the board, and then with a bucket of galvanized bucket of water, poured it down their nose. This was waterboarding. And uh, they had been questioned before this happened, and they were adamant in their refusals to answer any questions. And when the, um, <clears throat> when a sufficient amount of water, I thought they were going to drown. When a sufficient amount of water had been poured down their throat, they came up and they were sputtering and they just flew out with answers. There was a man that happened to and then there was a woman that that happened to. 
So I felt pretty bad about that. Then th that uh, evening, Captain Copeland uh, told me that I was going to take a squad out on an ambush. I had not, uh, my platoon had not gotten any kills so far. I was lacking. Uh, so he thought this was a great opportunity for me to get some kills. And the first sergeant, the Chuhoi first sergeant, was going to lead the patrol, which kind of angered me because, you know, not only did I outrank him, but he didn't speak the language, and, you know. Anyway, we went out on this patrol. Fortunately, there was a full moon, or nearly full, so I could see where we were going. Uh, it was Chuhoi first sergeant, then his sidekick, then me, and then my radio operator leading this group. And uh, we were kind of pretty much in a clearing. So we came to uh, kind of a jungly place, o overgrown. But before, just before we got there, there was a hooch, and there was a light on in it from a candle. And there was a family inside. And the first sergeant went in, and uh, went into the hooch, he held the patrol up. He went into the hooch, and I remember his sidekick kind of faced me and made sure that I didn't move the men. And I heard some uh, loud voices in the hooch speaking Vietnamese. I didn't have any idea what they were saying. And then the first sergeant came out with a man, uh, a civilian, and um, he got him in line to march with us to this ambush site. So it was um, I, I call him the henchman. This was the first sergeant's assistant. He led the patrol, followed by the uh, kidnapped civilian, followed by the Chuhoi first sergeant, followed by me, followed by my radio man. And just before we got into the bush, um, the civilian broke for it, ran to his left. And the um, first sergeant raised his M1 carbine and fired one shot. And the civilian went down. And I went over. He wasn't moving. I went over to look at him. Um, he'd been shot through the neck. I'm sure he. I, I'm sure it broke his broke his neck. He was dead. He'd fallen on his face. I flopped him over. We called the corpsman up. Um, there was nothing that could be done. So I called back to the sixth, my Captain Copeland, and told him that there was no use putting in an ambush. It had been blown. I was hoping that he would agree. But he did, and I was able to. Uh, take the squad back. But I folded, I remember folding the corpse's arms across his chest before I left. And yeah, so I carry some guilt about that. When you tell that story, do you picture it or do you disassociate? Are you separate from it? Let's see it now. John, you also served, and then you went to work for many years for the US government that sent so many people into these situations, including yourself. You, you enlisted, right? So all three of you enlisted. So in, at, to differing degrees, you made a choice, but your government still sent you there. How do you reckon with these stories and, and what you were asked to do on behalf of your government? Well. <clears throat> like David mentions in his book, we grew up in a generation where you did watch the John Wayne movies. You, you thought that's what you did. I mean, um, and the experience there made you understand that what you see is not always what's going on. I think of uh, two instances. It was uh, 1972. We were not supposed to be in Cambodia. And I was there during Vietnamization. And we were supporting that. There were still combat troops there. but. Beginning of the year, 136,000 Americans, end of the year, 20 some odd thousand, so it was dwindling. And we're putting Vietnamese mercenaries 
into Cambodia. The CIA operative is on our helicopter. So that kind of gave me a case of the jaws, because it's your own country. Why are you a freaking mercenary? You ought to be fighting for But anyway, and so as we're going into the LZ, the pilots say, don't let him step off the helicopter because we're not supposed to be here. And at the age of 20, you go, I get it. We're not on the ground. We're hovering three feet off. We're not here. So, there was some, so that's a life lesson where you go, oh, that's how it works. And then another instance was um, we got done doing a VR. The, you know, we have gunships and a low burden. Anyway, you're trying to see what's going on. And our commanding officer was flying our helicopter. And so we were in a free fire zone. We had, you know, different rules of engagement, fire for fire, fire for pinpoint fire, fire with initials, all these different gradations of when you could engage. And we had a South Vietnamese officer on our helicopter. And so our CO, we're in a free fire zone, sees four or five groups of Vietnamese walking around the dike. So we go down on the deck, which we shouldn't have done because the gun cover was going back. But anyway, so we go from group to group and I remember our captain wanted authorization to shoot them because they were in a free fire zone and they shouldn't have been there. And they all pulled out their little Vietnamese flags and wave them, you know, and we had our 60s on them and we'd hover from group to group. And the captain wanted, and the Arvin advisor wouldn't let us, wouldn't let us, wouldn't let us. And then we get to one group where the rotor wash blew off the straw cap and the guy had a booty cap on. And so you're going like, he's obviously Viet Cong, now, are these people being held by him or not? Or are they Viet Cong? Long story short, we didn't. And we went back and we were kind of frustrated because you want a, a kill, right? Which is just absurd. But to this day, I go, you know, I'm glad we made the decision we made. But it very easily could have gone the other way. And so the thing in Cambodia and stuff like that, you realize that you just, you can't really trust all the time what people, government, is telling you. You need, need to take that extra effort to find out. And like, for an example, when Senator Leahy voted against going into Iraq, he took the extra effort to find out that there were not weapons of mass destruction. And that was a lot of people who felt so intimidated after 9-11 that they didn't know. And so the life lesson is you just, you have to put your effort in as a person, as a citizen, to be engaged and you know I'm not I don't think there's black helicopters over every horizon but you just have to pay attention so the life lesson was do your own homework uh, try to find out what is really going on and we historically you know we didn't I think if we knew now Vietnam just wanted their their independence you know so that's a whole nother story but I think about it every day all day but it's it's okay that was my college you know that was you know you, you think about it Every yeah, but day? it's not, there are some good memories. I had some really good friends. But it's just, you know, that was an a important reference point in my life. You know, you're 19, 20 years old, and it's, it's just one of those things you check off, think about during the day. You know, it's, it's okay. Has your relationship to your service changed over 50 years? Well, you know, I volunteered. Um, one of my sons, my son Mark's here today, his twin brother Jack. Uh, enlisted, served as a medic in Afghanistan, and the most frustrating thing about that, you're going like, here we go again. Then to see your son go off, you go, oh man. You know, so I've, I just, I have a lot of respect for the military. Mm -hmm. And we do have a highly trained, we're lucky that we do. And you know, I think if we listen to the military leaders more often and had more members in elected office who had served in the military, it gives you a different perspective. Yep about, and, and in life, what's important and what's not. But, and I kind of, over the years, grade myself on how I've led my life, you know, from A to F. I'm a, getting a more difficult grade. I started like at a B, and now I'm, I'm going down as I reflect on what I could have done better in life and in Vietnam. And that's the type of thing where I just think I could have done, you think of things you could have done better, there are things I could have done better. I was not, I was ignorant of the culture and the people and didn't really understand the suffering they were going through. And I had an attitude because we were trying to support the Arvind, but we knew, like in Afghanistan, we knew as soon as we left, it was gone. So. Bill, I saw you nodding there when John was talking about yeah. having served in the military. That, that changes your perspective on the world. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How? Uh, you understand really what's going on. Um, 
at a granular level. Yeah, I remember, I don't know why this comes up, but the, the uh, you know, it was just the hatred. It was so fearsome. My troops, uh, we wouldn't see the Viet Cong, but we'd run into landmines and there'd be injuries. And it was, it was more than frustrating. It just generated this anger. And many of my troops couldn't understand why President Johnson didn't just nuke North Vietnam. Just nuke them and be done with it, get us home. If I could, infantry. Yeah. You know, when you first go in the army, you know, you see the combat infantry's badge as a, you know, you don't understand. The, the infantry, and you mentioned the book where the guy says, we're in hell already, what else are you gonna do? I remember when our first cab troops would stand down, you'd see them come in from the field. There was nothing in the world you could do to make their life worse, absolutely nothing. And it's just, I, you have the utmost respect for the, the soldiers on the ground who are actually out there doing it, it's just, it's, uh, level of respect that um, it's just incredible what they do what we ask them to do. Rusty, has your relationship to your own service changed over 50 years? Um, yeah, and it's been a, a spectrum. I, uh, when I first got, got home, I was still in the Marine Corps for another few years, um, I, I became convinced that, that the war was a, a colossal mistake. And uh, and the first thing I did about that was I put a Eugene McCarthy bumper sticker <laughs> on, on my Mustang and I was stopped one day at the main gate as I was driving to work and uh, was told to pull over because the skipper of the base wanted to talk to me. Um, so I went in seeing what's going on or rather, rather Captain Sachs reporting it already, sir. <laughs> um, and I was told that I couldn't bring the car on a base as long as it had that sticker. And I, I did have the, uh, the presence of mind to say political stickers are out, outlawed on the base. I apologize, I didn't understand that. But I've seen all these George Wallace stickers. Are they, I assume they're outlawed as well. And he said, well, I'll get back to you on that. And I kept, and it was never stopped again. They didn't do anything. But then when I got out of the Marine Corps and went back to, uh, went back to Harvard for, for a few years of penance, um, they, uh, I became involved with the, vets against, the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And uh, that, 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 that was a wonderfully cathartic thing because we got to, to yell in the streets and accost people and, and, and scream and holler. And it, um, I'm not sure I agree with David that, that the anti-war movement was instrumental in ending the war, but it sure didn't make us feel better to be around people who, who, who thought along the same lines. Um, and now since then, I, I realized that some of those guys, super right though they be, are, are truly good friends of mine. And, uh, and I started pulling people together and started a local celebration of the Marine Corps birthday, which is the biggest holiday of the year. Um, it's so big they made a national holiday of this following day so we could recover. <laughs> um, and, and we've been doing that since 1975. Um, so yeah. I've, I've, Are you it, proud of your service? Absolutely, absolutely. But, but I, I'm a little spoiled in that. My job wasn't killing people. And even compared to other aviators, it wasn't dropping bombs. I flew medical evacuation I went in where guys were getting shot and pulled them out so they could get patched up so they could go get shot again. And, uh, but I, but I, I figured, I, w I was talking with a guy, I've never seen him before, never seen him since, who was my seatmate flying home from Vietnam, uh, a kid named O'Neill, he was from California, he explained to me what a taco was. Um, <laughs> I, f I figured that during my time there, somewhere 
on the order of 1,500 Marines and civilians and, and, and army. 1,500 wounded people got taken to shelter because I flew them there. And that, uh, that could attenuate nightmares for a while. Bill, does pride, where does that word fit for you? Um, yes, I'm, I'm proud now of my service. I want to just add a little rejoin, uh, addition to something Rusty said about the, the um, bumper sticker for George Wallace. If I remember correctly, in 1968, George Wallace carried five electoral states. You know, and it's something to think about today with the electoral college that we're stuck with. Yeah, hmm. yeah but I'm, I'm proud of my service, yeah. You two are yeah. friends. How did you connect? Um, he showed me where to go to get a tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> really? Well, true, it's not no. responsive. Um, it, he tutored me and uh, made it possible for me to pass the bar. He was, he was a, a lawyer. Were, were you working for Skip? You were working, you were working for, for, for Paul, uh, Paul, for, Paul Hudson. And then Mike yeah, Sheehan. And then Mike Sheehan. Yeah. That's right. And uh, I, was, uh, I, I was in law school when I met him. And, uh, and, and we had this Marine connection. And, and uh, there were several other lawyers, some of whom were classmates of yours in law school. Costello and somebody yeah, else. Yeah, Tom Costello. Um, oh, Tom Co Costello. F Field Miller, yeah. Oh, Field. Oh, Field, who I'd grown up for. I babysat for him. Um, and uh, may his memory be a blessing. Uh, do, do, we, we, we know each other socially, not militarily. But it, especially in the 1970s, Vietnam experience would, would show itself. John, is there a, a bond or a, a fellowship that you share with each other just by virtue of having served, notwithstanding that you know you're an army guy in there? Yeah, there's a Marine Corps. Well, you know, my godfather, my uncle Bill, was in the Marine Corps. My, my mother told him on the phone that I had joined the army. He said he did what? You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it's always been a sore spot. Yeah, there, there just is. There's a, a, a mutual respect, and you know, you can't um, you, you can't tell. Uh, a veteran or a Vietnam veteran by looking at it. There's so many different stories. And one of the things I did want to mention, when I was with the CAV, we flew around Tainan and Lai Ki a lot. And the first infantry division had carved out of the jungle, you can see it from the air, the insignia of the big red one. So you'd fly over, it was right there. The Vietnamese couldn't see it, but we could see it from the air all the time. So yeah, there is just that, that bond. And you know, the army at least had stars and stripes. The Marines read that too, the newspaper they had over there. But it just, your experience is different, regardless of what your job is. And plus, especially when you're younger, I think, you're over there, you get to view America from afar. You know, we'd all come out, I'd just come out of high school, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. It was a different perspective. And you really figure out what's important and what's not in life. You know, in the legislature, when people are freaking out, I said, hey, overall scheme of things, no one's dying here. Life yeah. is pretty good. So I think that is that mutual respect and appreciation that you have and you know I'm, I'm proud that I did it I mean I volunteered that was the thing to do um, but over the years I I think about things I could have done better you know I just reflect on it and not only so you know it was gives you a perspective that I think is helpful I want to save time for some questions from the audience so um, as you think about what you might want to ask you know, all three of you, it's interesting, have lived a life in service to others. Yes, even lawyers are in service <laughs> to others. And I, I'm curious if you think you went down that path because of your service in Vietnam or if you enlisted because you already had that service mindset. Which, which shaped which? How did, how did your life path unfold in this direction. Bill? Uh, well, I was, a, I was gonna be a lawyer ever since I was a little kid. My father was a lawyer, I was gonna be a lawyer. Do you feel like you've lived in service to others? I guess, I, I, I'll say this about my service. And one of the reasons I value it 
um, you know, I came from an upper middle class background. And going into the Marine Corps, I met, you know, people that I would not have met otherwise. There was something called the, the Marines were so desperate for cannon fodder, that they had something called Project 75, where they were willing to accept into the service anybody that had an IQ of over 75. And, you know, there are really some limited people, you know, and you get to know them. Um, it's an interesting point. The, the going to the Marine Corps certainly broadened my perspectives because I was from a from a pretty lily white upper middle class family. My father was a surgeon. His father was a surgeon. Um, everybody went into professions that would help make the world a better place. Um, that really didn't motivate my enlisting. My, I, I was enlisting because I, I spilled this handful of black paint uh, on the family escutcheon and had to atone for that and do something honorable. Um, and I figured, well, I'd read Battle Cry uh, when I was in high school, which is a Leon Uris book about World War II Marines. Um, Leon Uris was a big, <laughs> A Marine Corps veteran and a writer, for those of you who are unaware. Um, the, uh, I, I, I went in hoping I would do something that would make people proud of me. And, uh, and then they said, you got really good eyes, you've got to be a pilot. So, and that was something that was going to be exciting. And as much as service to others is been a, a summum bonum of my life, so is adventure. And, and the adventure of it all, I mean, nobody knew where Vietnam was when I enlisted in 64, um, except geographers, maybe. Um, and, but, but it sounded like some, some really exciting shit, man. <laughs> I wanted to get in on that. Um, since then, I don't know, uh, atoning for it, for some of this stuff has been important. But, yeah, and, and I married a, a woman who decided she wanted to be a physician, and I was all for that, so. John, for you, life of service? Yeah, I don't know what came first. I grew up in a large Irish Catholic family, you know, a conservative Republican father, a liberal Democratic mother, so we always had a different perspective, but it's all, uh, so. I knew the reason um, I ended up getting into politics, and part of that was Vietnam, because I saw what happens when you're not paying attention, you know, when you're entrusting someone else to take care of business. And I saw what the real human impact was on that. And, to, you know, like I went in 1970, and in basic training, you know, you run and push ups, get in good shape, teach your tactics, first aid, and the mindset in the military. I remember at the end of our class on the Geneva Convention, the instructor says, now remember, we're not fighting a war in Geneva. That was the class in the Geneva Convention. You know, that was the mindset. That, things, you know, that was just you know, the training. So I knew that I would be an active participant, and there's still plenty of work to do, and I still feel like this is something I should be doing. Does anybody here have questions? I think we have a microphone that we can pass around. I can see Greg, yeah, he's getting the mic now. Okay. Have any of you all been back to Vietnam since your service, and what was that like? Or if not, would you consider going? I've had the good fortune of going back twice with Senator Leahy, and it was just amazing. Um, they were so forgiving, you know, and this is about, we still have issues to work through, but this is about going forward. And just, it's beautiful. I mean, you know, there's still work to do. We went to the Fulbright School down in Ho Chi Minh City, and to see the bright students now engaged, they were. You're going, you know, this is, it was incredible. So I've been, I've been lucky. It was and very emotional, able to go back to where I was with Benoit, and then a second trip to Da Nang, both places I had been stationed, and it was just leaving was sad, but I hadn't been back there for. It was just. You know, it was your youth. I mean, it was, um, I'd go back again. Don't know if my wife would go. It's too hot. 
<laughs> Might take my voice. John would be too wise to tell this. You see that photograph, Jeff had been behind him. He was, when we went to the Nang, he was the general. Everybody stood. Everybody stood when he walked in the room. Uh, no matter what their ranks, no matter where they were in government. Before we were going to give a speech, somebody, everybody was in the in the room, and I said, "Well, I have some someone here, the head of my Vermont office, John Tracy, served here today." He said, "Which one is John?" <clears throat> John served with the army, fighting against the Vietnamese. The general got off the podium. Everybody stood. He walked down where John was. John stood up. And then what happened? He saluted. The general stood at attention, saluted John. It's just incredible. Have, have the two of you been back? I have. I have not, and I want to go. You do. No. Um, I don't, I don't, I've been back a couple of times. Um, once with a bunch of Marines, uh, we flew from California to Taipei to Hanoi to Dong Ha, and, and then spent a, a couple of weeks driving around with a driver. You don't want to, you don't, you don't want to drive in, in Vietnam. Although, although they've got some wonderful traffic laws that, that protect you. The, the largest car in an accident is always at fault, um, which means pedestrians have the right of way everywhere. So the only way to cross the street is to find a little old lady with shopping bags and follow her. Um, but I, I went back that time, and the thing that, well, as we were approaching Da Nang uh, in the air, I and Ben Cassio, who had been my co-pilot overseas for a while, and I were eagerly looking out the window, and both it, it, it simultaneously said, holy, that there are no bomb craters anywhere. Because when we left, place looked like the, the face of the moon. And, and then we realized that it wasn't guys with big John Deere's and caterpillars. It was guys with shovels that leveled all those fields. And people were friendly. And people would, would stop you on the street and say, welcome back. Some, some thought we were Russians. And, but we were American, Russian, whatever they thought we were, they were, they were open armed. They were very glad to see us. That was in 2011, 2010, 2011. And I, lear I learned while we were there that the average population, that 70%, that 80% of the population in Vietnam at the time had been born since the last Americans left. Um, and, uh, and, and it's a young population. We were, we were old, we were all Papa Sons. And, uh, it, it, was, it, it, it was very therapeutic to, to go back. Greg? Um, thank you for coming and speaking to us today. Um, many of us in the anti-war movement were of the view and are of the view that the milita military leadership at the time, both in country and in the United States, was heavily responsible for the mistake that we're talking about um, because they deceived civilian decision makers, they deceived people in the military, and above all, they deceived the American people. You three have a special status to comment honestly as to the, your appraisal as to the quality of the military leadership from your perspective during this period of time. It was terrible. I mean, you know, it was just mistake after mistake, lie after lie, and I'll just tell you, this just sticks in my mind. When I first got over there, the American rifle, the M14, was being replaced by the M16. It was a terrible weapon. I mean, it, it, it would jam. It wouldn't feed. American troops were getting killed because they couldn't return fire. Uh, the Vietnamese had this wonderful gun, the AK-47, which is actually Stalin's idea, um, and it shot 
automatic fire. It was accurate to 300 feet. Just spit it out. You could get it dirty, throw it in the rice paddy, pick it up, dry it off, and fire. Nothing like the M16. Finally, uh, you know, changes were made, but the military fought those changes. It was coming up from the, the Marines. So this, is a ter this weapon doesn't work. And they were trying, uh, you know, the Pentagon was trying to say, no, no, that's not true. You're not cleaning the weapon. You're not doing it right. They hadn't put chrome in the receiver. And when they did that, it, it was a better weapon. Still not as good as the AK-47. But it was just another, it was a lie that the brass was telling to those of us in the field. Rusty, what do you think? Little statistic that, that um, this isn't responsive, but there are 70 million AK-47s around the world, um, which is like, f f figure out how, how many people there are on the planet per AK-47. Um, it's, it's a staggering number, and it's, it's a, it is a very reliable weapon. And now that I've said that, I forgot what you were asking. <laughs> uh, Greg had asked it, to comment on the mistakes oh, of military oh, leadership. Oh, 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 it was a, atrocious, and a lot of it was the way the war got designed that people would, that, that, that soldiers, I include Marines in, in the word soldiers. <laughs> Fellow jarheads, sorry. <laughs> it's just, it's convenient. Um, we're going over there for a fixed amount of time, and then they'd be coming home unless they got killed. Um, and the officers, the high-ranking officers, all knew that they had to go over to get their ticket punched because they wanted to be generals eventually. And, uh, and this tended to, to create self-serving decisions on the part of everybody from Westmoreland all down. down. It's, uh, I, I hope he's rolling over in shame in his grave. He, uh, but, but, but it wasn't just the generals. It, every, 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 every colonel, every major was making decisions based on himself as well as perhaps to a greater degree than for the good of the unit and for accomplishing the mission. I'm not saying everybody was like that, but it was pervasive throughout the military <laughs> establishment, um, which, which messed up the war. You, you mentioned that very first story, Rusty, that you thought, is, is nobody going to say about these prisoners, mm -hmm. hey, no, you can't do that. You mm -hmm. can't throw them tied off the, you know, onto the floor. And nobody did. So, did the, you know, when you think about those mistakes, I think you've said it, it would have taken one person and nobody was able to do that, able or willing in that, one way that, or another. That's, that, that, that message got made really well. Um, teaching in Quantico one time, somebody asked about me Lai. And, and, we, and we pointed out, Flashback, My Lai was a horrible atrocity that took place uh, in I Corps in Vietnam when a bunch of, of women and children and elderly men were corralled into, into a big pit. And they thought they were going in there to be held. And then they, were, they, were, the they were hosed down. There was, um, all it took all it, all it would have taken in that incident we we taught our second lieutenants was for one guy to say hey cut that shit out and it would have stopped rifles would have been raised they would have stopped oh my god what have we done but nobody did and 200 enemies were slaughtered and and the senior officer to be punished for that just died recently was a second lieutenant yeah, yeah. Who, sh who never should have been an officer because he, he'd gone through OCS three times before they'd have given him a commission. Um, yeah, Nixon gave him a pardon. A yeah. Your Community commutation, sense, yeah. Commutation, yeah. Other questions? Sure. Uh, yet yeah, you've all shared some of your reflections on your experiences do you have a sense whether they may differ as enlistees versus draftees? 
Oh, I've never met a crack pig. Oh, I did, but I, I just, I, God, can you imagine just being plucked out of life and sent over to Vietnam? I just felt so bad for those guys. I mean, I made a choice. So I, and I, I remember one a guy, this one I was in Germany before I went to Vietnam, broke down in tears, college graduate, having listened to this buck sergeant who was challenged. He was so frustrated by the stupidity as a grown man just crying, you know. And so to the, yeah, I think, how can you get plucked off the street and sent over to war that you don't believe in? Huh? Rusty, did you say you, you never met one? You never met anybody who was no, drafted? No, I, well, I, I may have, but, but the Marine Corps wasn't taking yeah. draftees when I was in the Marine Corps. Right. And I didn't really hang out with, with soldiers or sailors. Never, never, we, they weren't around. Cool. Same. Yeah, um, the people that enlisted, like me, were enlisting because if they didn't, they were going to get drafted and they wanted to have their pick of service. And the Marine Corps got these folks. So you would have been drafted? Oh, yeah. I was, yeah, I'll, I'll tell this story. So um, I was going to go to law school. I was accepted. I had very low grades at Colby College, but I had high law boards. I was accepted at Boston University Law School. And I went home in 1966, the summer of 1966 ready to go to BU Law School in September. And the draft board uh, wanted me to take a physical, so I met with a group of other people we, in a bus. We went to have our physical. Almost all of us passed except for three or four or five. And on the bus ride, they were given uh, counseling because just because they didn't pass the physical didn't mean that they weren't going to have good productive lives and couldn't be a credit to society. On the bus ride home, they sat in the back but having a party, you know, and the rest of us were, oh my God. <clears throat> um, then I got my notice that I was to report to, I can't remember what fort, to, you know, become a private in the Army. I went to my draft board, local number 54, Bethesda, Maryland, and I s talked to the woman in there. Uh, I said, um, you know, I've been accepted to law school, and I'm happy to go into the service after I finish law school. That's what my father did. I, I just would like to go to law school before I get drafted. And she smoked a cigarette. She said, well, you'll have to fill it, form number 4574 in triplicate and have it in this office before 4 o'clock on Thursday. And I said, OK, could I have the form 4554? And she clearly annoyed got up out of her chair and goes through these filing cabinets and can't find it. And I tr decided to try to make nice to her and said, so what do you think my chances are with the board? And she said, well, there's four of us on the board. Three of them went to law school after they were in the service, and the fourth is me, and I can tell you how I'm going to vote now. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, don't bother with the form. <laughs> and I went to an officer, selection officer, in Washington, D.C., just immediately after that, he gave me a test. It took about two hours, a lot of math on it. Uh, and I handed him in the paper at the end of the time, and he took it into his office to grade. He came out and said, well, you passed. And I said, what was my grade? He said, I can't tell you, but you passed. And uh, he signed me up, and you know, I was in the Marine Corps after that, and I went home. My parents came home from work. They both worked for the government. And I, they said, Dad, well, how'd it go at the draft board? And I said, Mom, Dad, I'm in the Marine Corps. <laughs> Thank you for being here and sharing your stories. I certainly don't want the service of women to be left out of this conversation. The tens of thousands of women who served and then fought so hard to be recognized and to be given benefits when they got back to the States. Um, would you comment on the service of women? I'll comment. Um, I never saw an American woman except as a nurse. Um, there were over half a million American men that served over there when I was there. I think there's only eight women's names on the, on the wall that has 58,000 names on it. So, uh, you know, it's not like women were pulling half the yoke. They weren't given the chance. They could have. But that's not the way it was back in 1967. John? I had uh, some interactions with, with nurses because we crashed and spent the night out, and then the Air Force pulled us out. And we 
sent us back down to Saigon to spend the night in the hospital. And it was just so refreshing to see someone of the other gender who was so caring for all of us who were on the, there were 11 of, us on, 11 of us on the helicopter and some significantly uh, damaged. But it was so refreshing and nurturing. And nurses are like that anyway, by nature. But, so that was my interaction um, in Vietnam. So I was very fortunate to have that opportunity and have them there to help us. Rusty? Um, I can't remember ever seeing uh, an American woman in uniform in Vietnam. There were, there were donut dollies who came through. There were USO troops, and we saw one of those that they, in the officers' club <coughs> at Kiha, which was about half the size of this room with canvas walls and, and roof. Um, but, but I can't say anything from personal experience about women in Vietnam. There have been a number of pretty good books written by women. I think every one was by a nurse um, in Vietnam. Uh, there's one titled Home Before Morning, which was written, written by a nurse by named Linda Van Deventer. And another one which came out within the last year titled The Women, which I thought was a compelling novel, but it really wasn't, didn't echo any of my experience. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was a well-written chick book bestseller that happens to take place in Vietnam. And, it, and I think it's really more about substance abuse than about the role of women. Um, but, uh, but if you're a quick reader, it's a good, good, good book to read now. You can do read in two days. If I, Jane, if I, yeah, John, could, Matt Friedman, who hey. ran the National Center for Post Traumatic Stress Disorder, it. and Senator Lee stood up the funding for that. Uh, his wife, Gail, was a nurse in Vietnam, and just the bond that we had was just really something. It was uh, just Gail and pretty cool. Did PTSD together. <laughs> oh, she's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, she is. She's a awesome girl. Yeah. I'm going to flag Rusty's term of chick book and say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have time for one more question. Oh, dear. To what extent did your time in Vietnam shape or change your understanding of Vietnamese culture? Did you have any understanding of Vietnamese uh, culture? I don't know that my time in Vietnam shaped my change. It's the time after Vietnam, I think, that I was trying to figure out what was going on and who was this implacable enemy that we were fighting and what made him have such a spine and so willing to sacrifice. And I think since I've returned, I've learned a lot more about the culture than I did when I was over there. John, same for you. I mean, oh, you had exactly. Well, when I was over, I was a knucklehead. I didn't know. And I, it was Arvin, Vietnamization wasn't going well. I, I had an attitude because I was young and stupid. But now I realize, having read the history, if we had just respected their history and their culture, things would have been dramatically different. I mean, they've been, you know, they just wanted to get out from underneath the French, and then we, you know, we blew it. So it's, I've learned more about it. But that's where we don't know the history. And the, the Vietnamese said that in the book, you know, you don't know who we are, you don't know our terrain. We went over there just uninformed, but we did it because we were supposed to do it. So I mean, it's a beautiful culture and a great history. So. Our next panel is about the anti-war movement and protests on college campuses. And I, as we move from this panel into that one, Rusty, I'd love your thoughts on what you thought of the campus anti-war movement then and, and if that's changed in how you think about anti-war protests now on college campuses. Um, when I got out of the Marine Corps and, and was back on a campus, um, I was the New England director of Vietnam Vets Against the War. So when I should have been in classes, I was in, 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 the, in the streets. Um, and getting to know an awful lot of the kids who were opposed to the war. But we vet veterans were sort of consider considering them as the JV. They, they were against the war, but they didn't have any right. They didn't earn it. They didn't earn the right to oppose the war. Um, 
today, I, I quite frankly don't understand the, the degree of, of dissent among students and why they're, and, and who they're, they're complaining about. Um, the, uh, I, 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 I can't compare them to us. When, when our contemporaries were complaining of the, about the war, there was always this shadow of, well, I'm opposed to the war. I sure as hell don't want to be there and get killed. That, that's, that doesn't come into play right now uh, with respect to the kids who are complaining about things going on in the Middle East. Um, very few exceptions. Three kids who got shot in Burlington, for instance. Um, I, uh, I, th I, th I think there's an enormous difference in, in, um, in motivation for the, for the protesters today. Bill, what do you think? Um, the question again was, I, what, was what did you uh, think about campus anti-war protests then, and, and how do you think, you know, how has that perspective changed or, or shifted well, over the years to now? I don't know how it's changed. I remember when I, after coming back, I was released from active duty. My wife and I went to visit her favorite uncle in Amherst, Massachusetts, where he taught. And I attended a anti-war rally. And I just felt like I wasn't welcome there because I was a veterinarian. I was also offended because many of the protesters were carrying North Vietnamese flags, which then had red above and blue below the star. And, you know, I thought that how those soldiers uh, had killed my friends and I didn't want more, any, any, any part of any more protests. Well, Rusty, Bill, and John, I, I really appreciate you sharing your perspective here and, and thinking back to those days and thinking about how your lives have moved through these last 50 years. Um, how that experience shaped you and how you chose this path. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us. Thank you for